people of tomorrow. The key was hidden from the eyes of the world and is now found again by the purest of heart. The sacred guardians of the key were appointed by nature itself to protect the machine and guard its sacred purpose. Until a time came when humankind needed its power once more. science fiction becomes science reality with the Qualcomm Tricorder X Prize. We are going to drive an era of healthcare abundance so that anyone on the planet with access to a mobile device will be able to have healthcare in the palm of their hand. What the Tricorder does is establishes a standard of care that the X Prize is making sure is going to be better than and faster than and more accurate than your average primary care doctor. The art and science of diagnosis is a really fascinating one. When I diagnose patients, I'm partly using data and I'm really using my instincts and my experience, which are good but, but limited. The revolution today is that we're getting more and more data that the body is producing constantly. This is going to completely change the way we do medicine. We're going to look back at today and frankly think that it was the stone ages of diagnosis. Hopefully this Tricor X Prize will stimulate a world when my grandkids will look back and go, you know, now I've got the power of, of a whole clinical team and hospital in my hand and we almost take that for granted. Our problem has been trying to fix healthcare by asking healthcare people how to make it better. And if we're really looking for something breakthrough and revolutionary and disruptive, I think we need to start thinking about how do you encourage innovation from outsiders and the XPRIZE competition model absolutely encourages that. To a certain extent, we're trying to make people who build technology, we're turning them into rock stars, right? And I think part of what the XPRIZE has done has been really to put a big boost and big publicity around this kind of thing and get people excited about working in science and working in technology and uh, creating, creating a better world. Yo, YouTube, what's up? It's your main man, Gab. Checking in with you. I'm taking my time out, man, and give props to Chadwick Bozeman right now. I want to say thank you. The lead actor and the king of Wakanda took time and um, dropped by and played a special little boy visit. A kid named Ian Hopegood, been diagnosed with a brain tumor since November of 2016, and he's an avid Black Panther fan. So Mr. Bozeman was kind enough to drop by and pay Ian a visit and bring him a bag of goodies and sign autographs and take pictures with him. But more importantly, he spent time. We all know that laughter and happiness is the best medicine of all. We wish Ann a speedy recovery. And once again, I'd like to say thank you to Mr. Black Panther himself, Chadwick Bozeman. Well, a young boy battling cancer really got an amazing surprise today. He got to sit down with his favorite superhero. Well, that's pretty fun. Ian Hopgood was recently diagnosed with a brain tumor. Family members say they're trying to focus on happy things during this difficult time, including Ian's favorite superhero, the Black Panther. And today, Ian got a special visit as Mapleton Elementary School actor Chadwick Boseman, who plays the Black Panther in the upcoming movie, showed up at the school to hang out with Ian. When I came in and, and he, he came and he hugged me, it's like literally I think it's the best response I've ever gotten as far as as far as the character goes. So thank you. We kind of go off the theory of, you know, laughter heals and joy heals and happiness heals. So that's how we live every day because we honestly don't know what tomorrow is gonna bring. Well, that's the right way to live. If you'd like to help Ian's family, you can find a link to their GoFundMe page on our website at fox5atlanta.com. Well, we were there the moment a Hollywood actor made a local child's dream come true. <laughs> As you can see, Ian Hopgood could not hide his excitement to meet actor Chadwick Boseman. Ian is battling cancer, and the actor plays his favorite superhero, Black Panther, in the upcoming Marvel movie. The two spent some time talking and getting to know each other. I told him I feel this good. And he got shot. And he had this kid. 
I don't know what I'm doing either. <laughs> he wailed the moose at night. He wailed, he wailed, he wailed at this right. Conventional science recognizes that all matter, each molecule of everything on Earth and beyond, oscillates at its own distinct frequency. Can the amplified voice of Ella Fitzgerald shatter this glass? The atoms that come together to form a molecule are held together with an energy bond that both emits and absorbs its own specific electromagnetic frequency. No two species of molecules have the same electromagnetic oscillations or energetic signature. By increasing the intensity of the harmonic frequency of the molecular structure of the wine glass, science can cause the glass to shatter. Leave it. This is a commonly accepted law of nature. So why can't other molecules be isolated and destroyed in the same way? Why can't the oscillation frequencies of killer viruses like cancer and AIDS be identified and destroyed? Why hasn't someone performed the research? Well, someone has. We are inherently explorers. We are inherently inventors. We are inherently discoverers. We are inherently problem solvers. People have to keep that flame burning. Making the world a better place is a primal human instinct. Social change is a team sport. Give someone a challenge and the tools to solve it, that's one of the thrills of being human. That's how things change. We're entering a day and age where literally almost anything can be made possible. That's what XPRIZE does. We set very audacious but achievable goals. We leverage them with a million or ten million dollars and then we go to the world and say, I don't care who you are, where you've gone to school, what you've done before, the first person to make that happen wins. You help bring about a breakthrough and we all win. It's a way to capture people's imagination and get them focused on a topic. And typically, some of the best solutions come from people you wouldn't expect. In comparison to the current leading methods of pancreatic cancer diagnostics, my center is 168 times faster, over 26,000 times less expensive, and over 400 times more sensitive, costing three cents per test and taking five minutes to run, and it has close to 100% accuracy. It's pretty mind-blowing. It's like a pregnancy test, but for pancreatic cancer. Even when he was small, he was making hypotheses and testing them, even though he didn't know he was doing. He was always testing his environment and seeing what would happen all the time, and so you had to watch him really carefully. <laughs> Jack is super curious, so he's always reading. He's reading journals, and he's online looking up things. He's seeing what's going on. I found this article, Will Jack and Draco go for the X Prize? The X Prizes are a series of multi-million dollar awards that are really to advance our society. And what they believe is that through competition, that really spurs on innovation. One particular X Prize that I have an interest is the Tricorder X Prize. Essentially what the Tricorder X Prize wants you to do is you have to create something the size of a smartphone that you pass over your skin and to, can diagnose any disease instantly. And it has to be inexpensive, it has to be really easy to use, as well as measuring like vital signs and several other important medical criteria. And so that would revolutionize how we look at disease diagnosis and treatment. It's pretty much like a life-changing and human race changing concept. We have acquired an EBE, an extraterrestrial biological entity. We're flying over to Europe soon to uh, take some tissue samples and do some uh, DNA testing. This was found in the Atacama Desert. We don't know how it came about. Here's the great view of the face and cheekbone, very complex. Now there is a fracture here and behind this right ear is caved in and that's how, how this, this this ET beam was killed. We have the best scientists in the U.S. from Stanford that are going to be doing the testing itself to see what this really is and also to rule out what it's not. On our way to Barcelona. Barcelona. To retrieve the evidence. Dr. Bravo. Hi, Are you ready for the trip? I'm ready for the trip. I'm so excited. Okay. We're going to do some very wonderful work and I can't wait to get the results. Upon arriving in uh, Spain to uh, 
look at the being for the very first time, I was kind of skeptical. It was definitely a game changer for my thought process to actually see it in person than to see it on film. Uh, the first thing we had to do was go to the radiology lab because we needed x-rays and CAT scans before we did anything. The head radiologist at the center um, saw the beam and was quite impressed. And the first thing she said was, wow, that looks like an alien. And when the CAT scan images started coming up on the computer, it was just profound. And I saw inside the bone, and I saw, you know, organs and lung material, brain material. I knew that this was not a hoax, it was not fake, that this was actually some sort of living creature. Royal Raymond Rife was a brilliant scientist who was born in 1888 and died in 1971. His studies at Johns Hopkins University led to his development of the technologies that are still commonly used today in the fields of optics, electronics, radiochemistry, biochemistry, ballistics, and aviation. He received 14 major awards and honors, including an honorary doctorate from the University of Heidelberg. During the 30 years that Reif spent designing and building medical instruments, he worked for Zeiss Optics, the U.S. government, and several private benefactors. Because Reif was self-educated in so many different fields, he intuitively looked for his answers in areas beyond the rigid scientific structure of his day. He had mastered so many different disciplines that he literally had at his intellectual disposal the skills and knowledge of an entire team of scientists and technicians from a number of different scientific fields. So whenever new technology was needed to perform a new task, Reif simply invented and then built it himself. In 1920, Reif began investigating the possibilities of treating disease with electricity he discovered that each disease he studied had different electrical characteristics and started subjecting these organisms to different electrical frequencies. His first virus microscope complete, Reif performed tens of thousands of lab tests in an effort to isolate the microorganism that caused tuberculosis. But, but Strecker, I mean, uh, Dr. Strecker, uh, he wasn't one that to really goof around. He just came right down to the facts, and uh, he said, okay, let's find out if, these, if, if this mechanism actually works. You know, and I'm going to get into some, some real detail here. First, let me, let me just explain a little bit about my background so they understand where I'm coming from. My work at the time uh, was audio engineering. I probably built... I don't know, thousands of audio amplifiers that are, are sought after today. That background is in audio engineering and design engineering for audio power amplifiers, which is if you really look at everything, everything requires an amplifier of some sort. So that's the way I've always viewed it, that it's just, you know, another, it's another item that allows circuits to work and things like that and allows you to hear sound and of course pass signals through you know filters and things like that but anyway what I was working on was uh, at the time was a, um, a three-dimensional sound system mm -hmm. where you could place the singer in the center and then you could actually take the two speakers and fold them out around you in other mm -hmm. words interferometry because Rife used no audio frequencies. The audio frequencies used were changed by John Crane. And uh, that's not correct. Crane thought that he could use a paddle 
and a regular frequency generator that you bought off the shelf and you could just lower them down by 10 and this would work but that's not true that's not going to work Rife was very particular on the instrument that that did this and Philip Hoyland is the one that gets the credit for this because it's sort of ingenious the way it generates this you can see here and so that's why nobody ever knew the frequencies because uh, Philip Hoyland could change the fundamental frequency and then you could change the sweep generator to match up his frequency so it's really important that you understand that that you just can't buy a generator that's putting square waves out in the audio range from 20 to 2125 and expect any kind of results whatsoever except for stimulation in other words you might as well just buy a tens unit because that's what you're going to get nothing the next thing we're going to show you is this is a hpg1 by velamin this is also available on amazon um, there's a link to this as well on sidebandgenerator.com. You scroll to the bottom, there's a link where you can get this on Amazon. This puts out a frequency at the right voltage and, and the right waveform. And what that does is it goes into the sideband generator. And if you have the fundamental frequency here and you get these other frequencies coming in and you can say it's kind of bouncing off that fundamental, it's going to create these ripples, which are like these sidebands. And you can see what that's about on sidebandgenerator.com by looking at John's video. That will show you exactly what the, what the sidebands are about. So on sidebandgenerator.com, we have the instructions here on programming this Velamin sweep generator. Uh, sine wave only, 2.1 volts max. The sweep frequency you want between 100 hertz up to 120 kilohertz. Uh, set up, the minimum frequency is 100, max is 120 kilohertz. Step 100, um, sweep is linear, the speed is 0 0.1 uh, cycles per second, and uh, sine wave. And when you program it exactly like this, and we're going to walk you through that real quick, and you hook it up, that's going to give the proper sidebands, which will hit all the rife uh, uh, frequencies. And it takes, um, I believe it's maybe around 12 seconds or something like that for it to sweep through and basically hit all the right frequencies. Here has been struggling with a workforce issue. Um, there aren't enough doctors around. There aren't enough nurses around. Many people don't see a doctor, it's just sometimes it's too late until they've had the stroke, had the heart attack, diabetes has developed, cancer's evolved. In the United States alone, we already have at least 40 million Americans who don't have access to a primary care physician or don't have insurance. If we can find a way to empower patients to do more on their own, that's the most impactful uh, result that the Tricorder could bring. The goal of the Tricorder X Prize, I think, is to put control of health back into uh, the hands of the patient. The impact will be to get people access to better knowledge, better information about making better decisions about their health much more quickly. A tricorder-like system could apply certainly in a system that watches you over time and starts to see, wow, there's trends in your heart rate data and breathing data. Let's take for an example uh, somebody with uh, the beginning signs of, of diabetes. With the tricorder, you can get continual feedback and you can sort of manage your own course of progress and maybe uh, stave off the disease uh, before it starts. So just like you want that check engine light on early so you go to the mechanic before your car breaks down, I think similar analogies We'll play it in healthcare. We know that uh, black Americans have one of the highest incidences of prostate cancer in the world. And in this country, the incidence is about 35% higher than for American uh, Caucasian men. But the mortality is twofold higher and has remained so over many years. The researchers don't know exactly why. It is suggested maybe our diet maybe our stress level. Some have even suggested that our testosterone runs higher. We, we really don't know. But I was uh, strongly suggest to the African American that we treat this as what it is, an epidemic. My introduction to prostate cancer started with the death of my 46-year-old brother from cancer, then my dad four months later. And then I was told by uh, doctors that I should be checked, but being ignorant to prostate cancer and not knowing what it was, that was my first, first, first ever screening at age 50, uh, the same month that my dad passed away and uh, came up positive. And I, and I got this wonderful idea, you know, why don't I just go around 
and spread this word. Welcome to it, man. This, this is our report on our scientific retreat. I saw out a need for help in the underserved and that although we're so disproportionately affected by prostate cancer, it's not always because we're not screened. The reason is because we just plain old cannot afford it. And if you're not feeling any pain, we tend to not go to the doctors. Those are the individuals where the message really needs to be gotten out there. And um, interestingly enough, there are a number of free screening programs, I would bet, in every city. But we need to get the message out to the populations that are really underserved because they have the highest mortality and they have the most to benefit from early detection. Jack loves a big challenge and he is not frightened of failure. What makes me nervous is just the vast amount of people that are competing in it because there are 245 other teams and they're all major corporations and teams of adults. And I have a team of all teenagers. I've collected like the team of the most elite, like prestigious science prodigies in the entire world. My first work on my XPRIZE team is going to be making something called a Raymond spectrometer. Raymond spectroscopy is such a powerful tool just because it tells you exactly what's in something. So you can look at like environmental management, you can look at national security. You could say, is that a bomb or is that just a drink? So then you could potentially bring your drinks onto an airplane finally. And then also it could tell you, for example, whether you have a disease or not. And that's what's so cool to me is that I can actually look at your blood and say, these few proteins have to be there. So that means you must have this disease. Essentially what I'm doing is I'm taking something that's the size of a room and shrinking it down to the size of a sugar cube. And also, I'm shrinking its price from $100,000 down to $10 and making it more sensitive, but also such that it can measure all of your blood analytes. So I'm advancing the field of renal spectroscopy by a lot here. This is a really long-term endeavor for us because it's a two-year endeavor of really concentrated work. And two years is like, that's one eighth of my entire life. So it's going to be a really significant portion and I'm just really excited about it. This is the very first time that this method, I actually thought up of this method entirely on my own. I want to change the world for a better society. And I want to show others that they can definitely do that. And that regardless of your age, your gender, your ethnicity, regardless of anything that you can accomplish something and change the world. Got too much tissue on it. They actually want a piece of the bone from at least a like a 0.5 of a millimeter in. We took uh, material from inside the cranium, also uh, two clippings of the anterior front ribs of this bean. And we were able to see under the dissecting microscope that in fact it did have bone marrow in them, so that meant there should be some good genetic material in there. It was really nerve-wracking. Imagine, you know, two big guys here trying to operate on this 13 centimeter long bean. But we did it. The DNA analysis uh, is being done by some of the world's best, but even the world's best need to be cross-checked, which is why I'm doing the three different facilities. So I actually ran four samples. Uh, I ran a sample of my own blood, a very small amount, uh, just 100 microliters. I ran two blanks, things that just had water in them, because that would be uh, essentially a contamination control. Uh, and then, of course, the sample itself. 
And really the uh, all important first result was uh, whether or not there was in fact any DNA uh, which was isolated. And the actual shock for me was when I got the amount of DNA out of this sample, it was way above uh, what I had originally expected. What you have on the left here is a so-called DNA ladder. This is a size standard. Uh, this one on the end is in fact uh, my uh, DNA, and it has an expected size distribution as well as some banding. And validating the original uh, measurement uh, is this analysis that basically shows that we have a nice distribution uh, for the sample's DNA. Traditional scientific procedure requires the staining of samples to make them visible under the microscope. Unfortunately, the minuteness of the viruses made them impossible to stain with the existing acid-based stains. Reif conceived a method of staining the samples with light and began building a microscope that would enable the frequency of light to correspond with the electrical frequency of the microorganism under observation. His cancer research began in 1922, but it would take until 1932 after thousands of tests that he was able to isolate the microorganism which he named the BX virus. By 1933, he had perfected that technology and had constructed the incredibly complex universal microscope, which is capable of magnifying objects 60,000 times their normal size. With this incredible microscope, Reif became the first human being to actually see a live virus. Until quite recently, the universal microscope was the only microscope able to view a live virus. Reif painstakingly identified the individual spectroscopic signature of each microbe. Colleagues of Reif reported his incredible patience, sitting at the microscope many times for over 24 hours straight without a break. Once he discovered the oscillation rate of a particular organism, Reif concentrated on refining his method of destroying it. He used the same principle to kill the virus as he had used to make the organism visible, light frequency resonance. By increasing the intensity of a frequency that resonated naturally within these microbes, Reif increased their natural oscillations until they distorted and disintegrated from structural stresses without harming the surrounding tissue. Reif called this frequency the mortal oscillatory rate, or MOR. Here's the key point, interferometry. It's actually something that takes the sound apart and then puts it back together in a new mix. So in other words, what you end up with is you end up with a new uh, right and left channel, and then you end up with the spatial dimensions, which you can alter and you can move around yourself with phases and things. And this is why I've put the pictures on the Internet site, because this is very important when you mix sound waves. See, there's all these harmonics that are generated and everything. And it's not known, actually, you know, that it's a perfect frequency that actually killed these things. And this is what Strecker and I wanted to find out. We wanted to know exactly what was killing these, these little bacterium and viruses. Dr. Strecker and, and myself probably spent months Here's what exactly, we went and we picked up, we went and basically hired John Cray. And Reif was pretty precise about the way that this worked, because um, you have to be right on or you have nothing. So I think uh, it was one-tenth of one meter, which is about 800 cycles. So see, you're at three, two, four, six, eight, eight here which puts you well in range, but since you're sweeping the whole band with a sweep oscillator, and uh, you're going to hit it no matter what you do, and you're gonna hit the other things too, because we could actually pick another thing and put it in here, and, and you'll see that it'll end up on the correct side band. But I wanted you to understand that. I'll give you one more look here at the tube. And, of course, the audio frequency is up here. You can see it being sweeped. Okay. Sorry about the glare, but that's the way it is. So. And that's what you must have. 
and that's what I have to say about it. So this unit here is about a 1.5 to 2 watt unit, which doesn't sound like a lot, but it's actually a lot when you're talking about uh, RF uh, power. And it, uh, there's a lot of misinformation out there that you know you just have to use the, the gas tube like Rife originally did, but that's eating up 90% of what's going into it just to light the tube and then the, the remainder is what's there to be broadcast off and so and this is actually a better way to do it and if you go to rpx uh, bedini rpxbook.com and you study that book and the dvds that will show you exactly um, why that's so and also um, one of the things john bedini did which was uh, one of his last great le legacies um, that he left uh, with us all is that he op basically open sourced this technology in that book and video DVD in the book there are schematics you do have to have some type of RF circuit experience to be able to build it but the circuit in that book will work and it will do exactly what this is doing this is just a little bit more sophisticated it's more compact just using all surface mount parts so it's pretty small and uh, sleek and it's um, a little more sophisticated than the circuit in the book. Both of them work, so if you do have RF experience, you don't have to buy one of these. Go to RPX book, uh, Bedini, rpxbook.com, get that book, and you can see the schematics in there. Um, otherwise, uh, we have these available here. For the developing world, where there's real problems in getting access to healthcare, you can imagine a tricorder over the cell phone network really having a huge, huge impact in the diagnosis and the cure of some really you know, very prevalent but actually very simple to cure diseases. We have about $50 million of prizes on the table right now and $200 million of prizes in development at different stages in the pipeline. If you can find the right questions to ask, there are millions of people out there who are anxious to provide answers. Breakthroughs will come from the crowd, from people anywhere in the world. Right now I'm focusing on the Tricorder X Prize with a team of all high school students. So I got the all-stars of science fair on my team. And that's really the, the, the power of the X Prize. It serves as a magnet to draw the innovators around the world to attack problems they might not otherwise have focused on. It can draw awareness and attention to areas that may not yet be profitable, but may ultimately be life-changing for millions and millions of people around the planet. What's better than that? get solutions out there where government does not seem to be able to get its act together. What's the competition going to be that's going to ultimately make the breakthrough happen? What do you have them do? My name is Dr. J. Fistoswell. We are Team Juxtopia Imhotep from Baltimore, Maryland, USA. Team Juxtopia Imhotep is comprised 100% of students. Most of the students are from our, um, the city, Baltimore, City, Maryland. The students age ranges from middle school, high school, as well as uh, college age youth. Currently we have five students. The advantages of having a student team is that one, uh, they're hungry, they really want to do something that's very innovative, think outside the box. The pure innovation, eagerness, and propensity to learn is, is there. The disadvantage is that they may not have, the ex they do not have the experience as a seasoned professional. The work with the Google Lunar X-Prize uh, challenge has definitely influenced our work with uh, Juxtopia M and Imhotep. There can be crossover technologies from the Google Lunar X Prize competition to the Qualcomm Tricorder Challenge, uh, specifically in the sensing technologies. Matter of fact, our 16-year-old student, the youngest student on the Google Lunar X Prize team, came up with her own spectrometer design to be integrated into the robot and identify water on the lunar surface. My mother was an educator, my father was a social worker. I'm the only child, so they put a lot into me to engineer the person that's talking to you today. Had a great experience growing up and was exposed to so many things that I think contributed to my intellectual, social ability and providing that same experience for other youth that otherwise would have had that in their own family. I think it's a contribution that all of us should think about making, especially um, you know, creating the next generation of youth that should be better than the, than the previous generation. I haven't done anything. I haven't gotten tested. Salon owner Elizabeth Oloyade is one of many women who have not been proactive in the prevention of cervical cancer. Recent studies show that black women are dying from it more often than women of other races. 
Gail Hawk, member of the Arizona Cervical Cancer Coalition, has had years of experience in the healthcare field. She says research shows that certain demographics are dying from disease for various reasons. Transportation, geographic location, race and ethnicity. Gynecologists agree that lack of good care plays a big role in why this difference exists, including Dr. Greenspan in Phoenix. African American women are at risk because of the access and the cost for health care. He stresses how common the cause of cervical cancer is, regardless of race. Cervical cancer is believed to be caused by a virus, HPV, human papilloma virus. Everybody gets human papilloma virus, and especially all women at some point. Because HPV is so common, doctors recommend getting regular screenings that can be done at clinics like this one right behind me. That way, any abnormal cells can be detected and treated before anything more serious happens. The test to get the cells is as simple as getting a scratch off your cervix. Dr. Sharon Thompson has been a gynecologist for over 10 years. Simple test takes only a few minutes to do. The advantage of working with other teenagers is not to be offensive to adults, but most adults, once you're over 30, you have these preconceived blinders on, so you can't really do as much innovative thinking as teenagers can. Being an independent scientist with a vision is very different than organizing a team. And when you're a team leader, you have to be able to listen to other people. So I think his soft people skills are getting a workout now, and I think that's really valuable for him. So when I started creating my team, I decided I would have to have kind of two sub-teams. One was going to be the software team who was doing all the data crunching, and then one was the hardware team where they're going to make all the instruments to gather that data. Each person that I've gathered for this team has a specific purpose. So one person, for example, is designing the image recognition for our miniature MRI. Another person's doing the data crunching for all of our data into a single diagnostic. And then on the hardware side, some person's working on the heart disease. I'm working on general diseases with biomarkers, and so I can diagnose virtually any disease with that. And another person's working on your lungs. And so it's really incredible the comprehensive view that we've taken with this. My research would definitely not have been possible in the pre-internet age. Just because the research would have been outdated and also I have all the world's information at my fingertips. The universal source of information on anything for me is Google and Wikipedia. That's all I've used for any of my research. My name's Emery Smith. Uh, I've been with CSETI for approximately three years. Getting the baseline reading. From us. My duties consist of a couple things. I am uh, Dr. Greer's head security detail. Uh, I also am their photographer. I operate anywhere from two to six cameras at one time. Yeah, that's our craft. It was over the mountains in this room. Many of the craft that are coming in are transdimensional. And the way I understand it, not visible to the human eye. And that's where this new technology, uh, night vision, that's where that's coming into play in. With the advent of new technology that's out there, it becomes easier and easier for us to capture these beings and these celestial objects on film. After you do the night vision, it has that green hue, of course. And after a while, when you get back to real life, you're thinking, why isn't everything green? This can't be reality. I want to show an early one from Gulf Breeze from 1992. We went down there, and one of the fun things that happened is that I had about 40, 50 people. Let's go out on the beach. And we didn't have good cameras then, but you'll get the feeling of how exciting it was to have all these people, and one, and then two, and then three, and then four ET craft materialized right in the sky. There it goes. One, two, three. And look, there's four. There's four. There's four. We have a confirmed CE5. Holy damn hot shit. <laughs> Dog. Thank you. All right. So the point, <laughs> the point is, <laughs> it's fun. Half a century later, doctors began using a like technology known as lithotripsy, where kidney stones are destroyed with high-energy shock waves. Identify the MOR of cancer cells. Turn up the volume and destroy them without damaging the host organism. It sounds like a scientific miracle, 
but will it work on the human body? In 1934, a clinical study was set up at the Scripps uh, Annex. Now this is the Scripps Ranch, it's owned by Ellen Scripp. And uh, there they set up a clinical study under the auspices of Dr. Milbank Johnson. And they had a team of physicians that examined terminal cancer patients. Every one of those patients was declared terminal by their uh, group of scientists that was involved in this study. Dr. Reif would take some of the blood, examine, find the particular frequency for that organism for that patient, tune that instrument to the patient. Within two months, 14 of the 16 patients were declared cured by this team of physicians. It took another six weeks to cure the remaining two. 100% cure rate. We, we drove to San Diego and uh, we found Crane's house, about four or five of us. And uh, we went up and we knocked on the door and of course Crane answered the door, but the, the house was like in a shamble when we got there. But I said, you know, the first thing that I wanted to see was a microscope. So I got led down this aisleway, Jeff, through all these boxes and everything, and I ended up in this dirt cellar. Yeah, dirt cellar, like a root cellar. And uh, that's what I remember. You know, broken cement, some dirt, broken cement, some more dirt. All right. Here was this beautiful virus number three microscope all taken apart. It was just in pieces. And my main reason basically for getting into this 22 years ago, was I had an aunt that was dying of breast cancer. And so I was really, I was really interested, and John Crane claimed that he had the cure, which was this little, you know, $500 box, which he, which he took $500 from the 12 of us, of which at that time he didn't have the generators that he promised. And so we drove out there. But we, we not only drove out there because of that, we drove out there because of the interest. And it's pretty precise on the way you got to do this. This is generated with a triode tube. And uh, I think it's an 812 in there. A. And it's... Uh, the plates at about 600 volts here and uh, it just has to be done this way and uh, the grid coupling is very important because you can see the shift here if I take the audio frequencies away you can see the fundamental rock backwards and forwards that's due to the uh, power supply ripple and that's kind of a good thing because you want it to waver like that a little bit back and forth. That way you cover pretty much everything you're going to try to get. And that's what happens when you put the audio in. So I can generate the most bands here. Which means I can cover just about anything I want with his frequencies. And so what we're going to do is we're going to open this up. Again, this is the Velamin HPG1 pocket function generator. Nice little package here, and these are also a pretty good price uh, delivered even on Amazon. So this has the little uh, uh, output jack uh, converters, and um, uh, you can actually charge it up uh, with a USB port. So what we're going to do is just kind of open this up right here, and it's got a built-in rechargeable uh, lithium-ion battery, so you get a lot of running time off of one charge. And so if you need to charge it up, you can just take this, you can put it into this jack right here. You can plug that into a USB port and um, it'll charge up. You disconnect it, you turn it on, and you can see that there's no power right now. So what I'm going to do is take a, take a short break, charge it up, we're going to come back and uh, finish up and we'll show you how to program it. Well, like a really? Rife machine with frequencies, they have done the same thing with this device. Wow. So they have measured every type of you know, element uh, that there is and have me measured how that frequency comes back. That's why they can build not only a, 
a volumetric image, but actually tell you exactly what it is. The technology we were talking about earlier with the low frequency ground penetrating radar also can be used, uh, you know, it can actually be fit inside an iPhone. Really? And you can place this on your hand or on your chest, and it'll show you your hand. And you can zoom in all the way to the actual cell hmm. and say, all right, I have three cells here next to him. This one's metastatic. Can't, I mean, this is a cancer cell. This is a tissue cell. And then zap it. And now you just cured yourself of cancer. So it's that. The resolution on this device is that amazing. Hmm. So you can actually just put it on your hand and then zoom right in to wow. the cell itself and move around. That's crazy. You know, it is beautiful, most beautiful technology ever. And, you know, it's available. It's just sitting there. And I, I'm hoping that this talk will inspire the inventor and, uh, you know, POTUS to, like, step up on that. Because not only is it a great security thing for, you know, the world, but it's also a good thing for health. You know, it's an amazing, beautiful oh, thing yeah. to help uh, you could heal yourself, you know.